All right, now we're going to move on to gravitation, a very heavy topic. So um, the force of gravity is given by this equation here. Um, so <clears throat> the force of gravity is proportional to the product of the masses, inversely proportional to the separation between them. And that constant of proportionality is this gravitational constant G. G is actually really small. So gravity is a very weak force, not the weak force, but it is a weak force um, compared to, for instance, um, the electromagnetic force, which uh, is very strong. But that's also part of why we can actually see gravity because the electromagnetic force is so strong that you don't ever see things <coughs> um, that are electrically charged, for instance, that are too far apart from each other <laughs> for a long period of time. Um, and what we've done with gravity so far has treated this as a constant. We'll talk about why you can treat gravitation as a constant close to the surface of the Earth. So this force of gravity actually attracts all things that have mass um, to each other. Um, so it is everywhere. Um, so you are gravitationally attracted to everything. Um, so here you can see a picture of galaxies. These um, galaxies interact with each other and move around relative to each other because of gravity. The gravitational force acts along the line joining to the centers of masses of two objects. Now, technically, <clears throat> it really is acting along all of the points of those different objects, except that um, when you get into more advanced courses you um, and, and have developed your mathematical skills a little bit more, you'll be able to see that you this is equivalent to treating it as if it were at the center of mass. It's a nice, lovely little trick that actually lets us solve something. If we had to consider the shape of every object, every time we uh, wanted to consider the effect of gravity, we would not be able to get very far. So the gravitational force is always attractive. It is always going to, <clears throat> well, let me put it, let me expound upon that a little bit. Um, the gravitational force is, every time we've measured it, it is, has always been attractive. The two objects are always attracted to each other. Now, you can find some minor technicalities. We have actually never measured the gravitational force between matter and antimatter or between two antimatter particles. So it is entirely possible that antimatter behaves differently. We've just, we have no data constraining that. Um, <clears throat> but for the purposes of this class, gra the gravitational force is always attractive. Um, and you're always going to look at, it's always going to be in the direction, um, pulling the two objects together. So in this case, um, the, oh, the force of mass one, um, mass one feels a force from mass two on it. The force of mass on mass one from mass two is in this direction. The force from mass uh, on mass two from mass one <laughs> is in the opposite direction. And those two forces are equal and opposite in direction. Now, this does also mean, for instance, that the, the Earth is, gravi you, you know that you are gravitationally attracted to the Earth, but this also means the Earth is gravitationally attracted to you. The reason you don't feel that on a regular basis and you don't see any impact is that the Earth is so much heavier than you are that you basically do not impact the acceleration of the Earth. All right, and here's an apparatus that you actually could use. We don't do this in our intro labs, but you could at least in principle use it to measure the, um, the impact, measure the size of the gravitational force where you're using two different, um, two different masses and you can actually tell that they are going to come closer together um, because of the gravitational force. <clears throat> so you let them actually, that you let them get attracted to each other. And you can use a mirror to measure um, to measure the that one of the that the forces that the masses are actually rotating. Um, but this is a very hard measurement to do because that gravitational constant is extremely small. 
Nevertheless, you can actually at least measure it. Um, so then the gravitational constant, we've talked, we've used this so far. Um, and when you are near the surface of the earth, um, and my guess is that unless you were an, a very exceptional intro physics student, you have never been terribly far from the surface of the earth. Um, you can treat the distance from the center of the earth as approximately constant and as approximately the radius of the earth. You're not going much further from, than the radius of the earth from the center of mass of the earth. So in this case, you have um, a net force, which is basically always approximately G, your, the, this gravitational constant times the mass of the earth over the radius of the earth squared, that's a, that's a two, times your mass. Or I will use my favorite subscript. Nothing special about all our fancy symbols. We can replace them by a stick figure. So in the past, we have used the force due to gravity near the sur surface of the Earth is equal to mg. So when you write it like this, you can identify this as g, as the gravitational constant. So we actually do get a nearly constant um, gravitational force near the surface of the Earth. In this chapter, you're going to start looking at what happens when that separation distance gets much further, um, when it, it starts getting far enough from the surface of the Earth that you have to consider the, um, the additional separation. Thinking about, for instance, satellites and um, projectiles escaping the, um, the gravitational field of the Earth. Now here you can see in greater detail, if you actually were to measure the, um, the value of G um, as you go out. Now the Earth is not constant density. Um, so if you could, and we can't, but if you could send a probe in um, and feel the, um, the force of gravity in the inside of the earth as you traveled from the center out, you would see that actually instead of having a constant, um, a constantly increasing acceleration due to gravity, you would have a slightly steeper slope and then, um, and then it somewhat declines. So this, um, this region is much more dense. The, the core is much more dense um, and has much more so much more mass per unit volume um, than the um, than the mantle. But then once you have escaped, once you're on the surface of the Earth, then you end up with um, an acceleration, which is um, now this is in thousands of kilometers, very near the surface of the Earth. You have an acceleration which is close to nine. Um, 0.8 meters per second squared, and then it drops off like R squared. So as soon as you start having to consider scales in this direction on uh, your distance from the center of the earth is on the same order as this, the radius of the earth, then you have to start worrying about the fact that uh, it's not a gra single gravitational constant due to the earth, but you have the um, this inverse squared law, the um, force of gravity falls off like the inverse squared. Nevertheless, near the surface of the Earth, we have a very good, um, we can treat it as constant to very close approximation. Now, this is the first time that we've mentioned fields. So you often talk about a field where you're isolating the impact of the source, in this case, the masses, from the, um, from the thing that it is acting on. So the force, we will actually 
consider, for instance, you standing on the surface of the earth. So the force of the earth on you is G times the mass of the earth times the radius of the earth squared times your mass. And then it's always going to be towards the center of the earth. So I'm going to use a negative r hat to indicate that it's towards the center of the earth. Um, and maybe we even let you move relative to this. Maybe you are in a, a spaceship. So he doesn't want to be in a spaceship. So then, I don't know how much you weigh, but the odds are that you and I weigh different, have different masses. So this part will be different, but we can still talk about the impact of the Earth independent of what that force is acting on. So we split out the gravitational field by just removing the things that are particular to that um, to the object it's acting on. And the gravitational field is then given by the gravitational constant, the mat times the mass of the Earth, divided by the separation from the center of the mass of the Earth and wherever you are in space. And it's always in the negative r hat direction, meaning that it is always pointing towards the center of the Earth. And here you can see what those field lines are. The field lines are showing these vectors for the magnitude of the field which tell you the direction of the force. If, so if you were to just plop some object, maybe I'm sitting here and you're sitting there, that's gonna tell you the direction that we're, that we're gonna go in each case. You guys will encounter fields in this concept of field more when we get to the second semester and you talk about electricity and magnetism. Now there's a subtle effect Mostly we're not going to work with it too much here, um, but you actually, um, because the Earth is not stationary, it is rotating, um, so you are in a moving reference frame when you are on the surface of the Earth, and um, on that moving reference frame, um, your acceleration due to the rotation is in this direction. Oh. It is not actually um, towards the center of the Earth, so you have some force due to the um, to the gravitational field and an apparent acceleration because the because you are on the surface of the Earth. So your apparent force will be slightly off center and not actually um, pointing exactly towards the center of the Earth. Now, work. Whenever we have something we're talking about, we want to talk about the, um, the amount, amount of work done. So you calculate the amount of work done as the force dotted with the direction you're moving in. What you can see, anytime you're moving around so now if we have our gravitational force, our gravitational force is always going to be acting straight out from the center of the Earth. So the gravitational force is always in this direction. If you have any motion which is along, it is in a circle around the object creating the gravitational field, then it's always going, your direction of, your instantaneous direction of motion is always going to be perpendicular to the force. So anything that you, that you, any movement in circles is going to do no net work due to the gravitational force. Um, however, we can do an integral now where we are moving 
in this direction. Um, and in that case, you would just have G, M, M. Often we put one M as big and one M as little, so we don't have to have subscripts. When you integrate over the radial distance from the center, dr. <laughs> And this is going to give you this value. So the work done is GMM over R. Now, technically, there would be plus a constant. Um, what we typically do is define the um, the constant to be zero at r equals infinity. Um, so if you are very 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 far away, we, sorry, we want the the work done to be zero if you're very far away. So we then set this constant to be zero, um, and then that we can also use to calculate a um, so that it, that gives us the change in potential. So the gravitational potential energy, and I actually think your book uses U, so let me go back and change that. The gravitational potential energy is G M M over R, is negative G M M over R. So you have more potential energy if you are further away from the surface than you if you are closer. All right, and then we get to orbits. You can have a satellite of mass m rotating around the Earth. Now, remember, I, when we looked at the work, anytime you have something moving in a circular orbit, the amount of the that um, change in that small movement, dr, is always perpendicular to the force, so you get no net work done. So there is no change in potential energy if you move in a circular orbit. Um, so if you have a circular orbit, now you also know that for a for circular mo motion, the acceleration equals V squared over R, <clears throat> and for the gravitational force, the acceleration around, say, the Earth is GM of the Earth R squared. So then you actually get a velocity which is fixed by the radius of the orbit. Or given the velocity, you can tell me what radius um, the, the orbit has. You can think about a circular orbit as being what happens when something is constantly falling inwards towards the surface. Um, so it is constantly moving towards the center, constantly falling towards the center of the Earth. And it's just that it has some tangential velocity, so a velocity tangential to the curve. And so it never quite catches up. It's always going to be somewhat falling. Um, now, when you're talking about big objects, um, you actually, consider the center of mass to be this. So this is the, these two objects are orbiting around each other. They're actually orbiting around the center of mass of the system. Ah, and this even told me where it is that you have um, this galaxy on the left is heavier than the one on the right. So this is the center of mass and they're actually orbiting around each other. Um, so the axis, the radius of the orbit is different from the separation between the two. You're looking at the separation from the center of mass. And then we can move on to Kepler's laws. So Kepler's first law states that every planet moves along an ellipse with the sun located at the focus of the ellipse. Now, when you get to upper division mechanics, you're going to derive this just like when you get to, you might not derive it until E&M when you see that 
actually you can treat a spherical object as if it's all located at its center. But right now you haven't quite developed the mathematical chops for us to do the derivations, at least not easily. I, I mean, you could suffer through them, um, but it is possible. It is possible to derive them, but we're not going to go through the derivation. Um, so for all of the planets, it's an ellipse um, and the orbit is an ellipse and it moves um, with the sun around one of the foci. The sun is at one of the foci. Um, and then um, what actually turns out, we don't, I don't know that, I don't think there's anyone has ever figured out a reason. Most of the, or the planet's orbits are really close to circular. They're not exactly circular, but they're really close to circular. So in most cases, you can actually approximate them as circular. Um, and here you can also um, look at the distance between the sun and the planet. Um, here you have the, um, the major axis of the ellipse. There's a whole bunch of special words when you're talking about elliptical orbits. I will admit I'm not a memorizer myself, so I always have to look them up um, and I always need a cheat sheet. However, one that's worth searing into your brain, the long axis is the major axis or the semi-major axis. The short axis is the minor or semi-minor axis. Um, <clears throat> and then the actual distance between the sun and the object that it's rotating around is a little bit trickier to calculate. Now, for all intents and purposes, in most orbits around our sun, the two foci are very, very close to zero. Not exactly, but very close. Now, all motion that is from an inverse square force, which is most, which is the two that you're going to deal with most extensively as an undergrad, the um, electricity and magnet, well, we combine the electric and magnetic force, but you can also say electromagnetism. Um, electromagnetism and gravity both fall off like one over r squared. That actually is really, really, really fundamental. And I'm going to go on a little tangent because it's so fundamental that it's cool. <laughs> That's because all of these forces are ultimately mediated by particles um, emanated from, emanating from the source. We haven't quite directly observed the graviton yet, but we'll probably, you might observe it in your time studying physics. Um, we might observe it in the time studying physics, but we <clears throat> now, because the LIGO experiment is awesome and it's on rack to see these things, but um, when you have a source like a mass, it emits particles and that's what actually mediates the force. That's what causes the force. And it emits them uniformly in all directions from the center, uh, from, from whatever the source is. And, the, and then the strength of the force is proportional to how many of those force medi mediators you have. And the surface area of, the sphe of a sphere is four pi r squared. So the density of these force mediators is always proportional to one over four pi r squared. <laughs> if you have a force where those force mediators can get far away from the source. Now for the strong force and the weak force, um, well, the weak force also merges with the electromagnetic force, but the strong force that doesn't work. And um, we, because we can't get the, the force carriers very far from the source. Um, but for the electromagnetic force and for, for gravity, they fall over the, the force's strength falls off like one over R squared because the surface of area of, the sphere, of a sphere is proportional to R squared. All right, so now any force that is caused by an inverse, any motion caused by an inverse square force is going to be one of four conic sections. This is also something that you can derive. 
that you will probably derive when you get to upper division classical mechanics. I can't do the derivation off the top of my head. And at this point in your studies, it would be a little bit of a distraction. So you're always going to get something of this form. Um, and then you have different cases. Um, for and this this number here is called the eccentricity. E is the eccentricity. This is a physical constant fixed by the force. Um, this is the separation of the two objects. Um, and then here, what this stands for is the energy in the orbit. So the total energy in the orbit. So if you have an eccentricity of zero, you just get back to a circle. Um, so you have R, you can simplify that in that case to R equals alpha. The radius of the orbit is some constant. Um, and then if you get an eccentricity between zero and, and you're in that case, your energy is negative because your energy goes like negative G M M over R. Oh, I want to put an R squared there because that's the force, but I, I have, I have written typos somehow, even when I'm writing by hand. My, my hand moves faster than my brain sometimes. Okay, so then if you have an eccentricity of between zero and one, you get an ellipse. So some form of ellipse, the radius, one over the radius is proportional to um, one plus the eccentricity times this, uh, times the angle. Um, and here you can see, we call them conic sections because they're also cross sections of a cone. <clears throat> um, you can get, if you have exactly zero energy, you get an eccentricity of one, and then you have a parabola. And it, for an eccentricity greater than one, you have a hyperbola. So anytime you have scattering, or let's say you have a comet, that is not, um, well, there are a few comets that have very, very, very large elliptical orbits, but they are actually elliptical orbits and they come by periodically. Um, or you can have a comet that has a hyperbolic orbit where it's not actually bound to the earth, but it comes by woo, and it follows the path of a hyperbola. Um, and we tend, there's a lot of, there can be a lot of special terminology around these because of course, studying the stars is where physics really got its start and why people looked at these things. Um, it was a hobby for, rel for wealthy aristocrats to, to look at the stars. Um, much of physics is driven by either that or the need for better military equipment. So, um, here you have, there's a lot of, you might run into various terminology. I always just look it up. No. And here you can have special cases where, for instance, you have something orbiting in a circular orbit um, around the Earth, and you want it to increase its orbit. So you give it a slight boost. You're going to, to start the rockets and get the velocity a little larger. If you increase the velocity here, it now has an elliptical orbit. Um, and now it's, it's in an elliptical orbit around the sun. Here you fire the boosters again and you can give it a little bit more velocity and you get, um, you get another circular orbit and you end up moving in the same orbit as Mars. So, this um, this particular ellipse is called a transfer or orbit, um, and here it's you're using the um, it has its perihelion, so the short end closer to the sun at Earth's orbit. So you launch it from Earth's orbit, um, and then it has its aphelion, 
so the longer one at Mars's orbit. Um, and that, so that's a, something special called a transfer orbit. If you want to actually be able to move from one, um, one region to the other. Now, Kepler's second law states that equal, um, equal areas are swept out by, plan by planets in equal times. So if you have a given planet and it's orbiting around, so it speeds up when it's closer to the sun because it has less potential energy. There's less potential energy here. So there's more kinetic energy here. There's more potential energy, so less kinetic energy. But it turns out that the areas of these, um, <coughs> the areas in a given time swept out by um, by this orbit is um, is constant. Um, and here you can look at a derivation. Um, of course you have to wonder what were how did people even figure this out? They were looking at all the data um, and um, trying to find patterns, trying to predict how they could predict where planets would go at what time. So they just spent a long time looking at data and um, wealthy aristocrats, wasn't a lot else to do, or th they didn't have to do a lot else. Um, they could play around looking at numbers for the stars because they were wealthy. Um, all right, so here you can actually use, so this is, looking at a small slice swept out by a given um, planet. So if you have an elliptical orbit, its instantaneous velocity at this point is in this direction. Um, and you can calculate the area of this triangle because this is its height. And, um, and this is its length. It's a funny shaped, um, it's a somewhat funny shaped triangle, but this is, this is its height and this is its base. So the area swept out by this is one half times its height times its base. Um, this height is V delta T sine theta. And this is R, so we can get the area swept out and then you can divide by the delta t let these become infinitesimally small and this is the expression you get for the area swept out as a given function of time now the angular momentum is constant because the force of gravity does no net work because the force of gravity is always perpendicular to the direction of motion so now the angular momentum is m r cross v um, and this is equal to m r v sine theta at least the magnitude is and we can look at this and go oh i can write da dt in terms of the angular momentum the angular momentum is constant so da dt is constant and that's the derivation of Kepler's law. Um, so as soon as you knew that, and actually the motion of the planets was used to uh, used by Newton to motivate the development of Newton's law of gravitation. But then once you have it, you can derive Kepler's laws. Kepler's third law is that the, this one is always a mouthful. The square of the period is proportional to the cube of the um, of the radius of the orbit, um, and this again you can derive using um, using Newton's law, you, you, Newton's law of gravitation. The derivation is not insanely complicated, but we're going to skip it. We can move on to tides. So tides come because the water on the earth is attracted both to the center of the earth and to the moon. And when the moon is on one side, the moon is gonna pull the water on the earth towards it. And it's when it's on the other side, it's gonna pull the moon on the water on the other, 
to the other side. <clears throat> um, so the tidal, tidal forces um, are along the line between the Earth and the moon. Um, it's a difference between the gravitational force on this side and that side that creates the bulge on both sides because the earth, because the, um, because the water on the earth can actually move. Um, and these can be up to a few meters. So it's, a, it's actually a small effect on the scale of the earth, but it is still, as you know, a measurable and significant for, effect. A few meters of the water going up and down, a few meters means a lot if you live on the water. Um, so the, the tidal force is the difference between the, the gravitational force at the center and at the edges. Um, and you can have tidal forces. So at the equator, they are largest. Off the equator, they are smaller. Um, and if you were able to go into the center of the Earth, these forces would get, um, would get smaller and smaller. So the spring tides occur when the moon and the sun are aligned, um, but you also can get tides when, um, when the moon and the sun are just off center. And then still you end up with the, um, the moon pulling the, the moon distorting the shape of the water. And here you can see some of the impact of high and low tides. Um, most of you have probably seen these, although Tennessee is, of course, landlocked. Um, and you can end up with bo boats stuck out of the water. That may or may not be a problem. Um, and other planets have even greater forces. So the, um, as one of the problems that we do in class, you guys calculate the, the size of the tidal forces, and you see that the tidal forces on EO are much larger um, than on the Earth. And this also can matter. Um, here you have a compact, um, some type of compact ob object, <laughs> and the material is, and it can, the tidal forces can actually tear material away from something because the forces are so strong. So these tidal forces can matter a lot. We're going to do a brief overview of some of the other effects. So. What we've talked about is, is um, Newton's law of gravity, but um, in general, the theory of gravity um, at larger scales is called general relativity. And it starts with the principle, actually relativity in general starts with the idea that we should get the same, <clears throat> all experiments should have the same results um, as in a, uniform gravitational so whatever the reference system no matter how you do the measurement you should always get the same results so for instance if you do an experiment in a laboratory in a uniform gravitational field it's going to look exactly the same as if you have a uniformly accelerating laboratory you can't tell the difference and this has some really wild consequences so this is mostly a class directed at physics majors you would move on to learn special relativity first and then general relativity. It turns out that um, when you get to general relativity, you can view the effect of gravity as being something that is distorting the shape of space time. So it's actually warping time and space around it because it's so massive. <clears throat> and the more, the heavier an object is, the heavier these distortions. Um, <clears throat> And you can actually see and measure the impact of these slight distortions. So most of the time you're not thinking about special relativity or especially not general relativity, but you actually use it every day if you use a GPS. And the GPS to get the high level of precision that we have, you require um, considering general relativity we can actually do even better than what you can get in a commercial GPS, but that information is proprietary because it's uh, it's not proprietary, it's uh, classified because the government uses it to track other countries, what's going on in other countries. And you can actually see, um, and this is another impact, 
of more advanced understanding of gravity that um, <clears throat> if you look at what the amount of visible, this is not quite relativity, but if you look at the amount of visible matter and you say, well, okay, given where we're seeing light, this is the speed that we would expect stars to have as you go out in distance from the center of the galaxy, what we actually observe is a lot faster. Um, so we hypothesize that there's a lot of matter that we do not see. Um, and this matter we call dark matter. Um, dark matter makes up more matter than real matter. We still haven't figured out what it is. So the world is wild out there. Um, keep studying physics and you will learn more about these things, but you're only at the beginning of your journey so far. Um, we're going to go through one example. Um, <clears throat> here that you have a satellite in an elliptical orbit about a much larger mass. Indicate where the speed is greatest. Okay, so you have less potential energy here. So your speed is greatest here and it's going to, oh, I got to draw it in the direction of rotation. Ooh, greatest here, smallest here, because your potential energy is smallest near the mass and largest away from the mass. Um, what conservation law dictates this behavior, um, conservation of energy. Um, indicate the direction of the force and acceleration at these points. So if this is the velocity, in this case, the force is here. Force is weaker in this direction. And the acceleration is always going to be towards the center. <clears throat> and then at the points, it asks you to draw them elsewhere. So here, the velocity is somewhere in between the other two. The force is always towards the mass. And here we're going to try, I'm going to try to draw them so that it's longer than the short arrow and shorter than the long arrow. But my artistic skills are somewhat limited. limited. Um, the acceleration is going to be in the same direction of the force. And there we have it. So that's gravity. Um, hope this whet your appetite for more physics and we'll see you for the next one.